Next, I'd like to introduce Raul Jain and Catherine Corston. Raul is the CEO of Peach Payments, a leading payments gateway in South Africa, Kenya and Mauritius. He has worked with ShopRite, Pepcor, Zando, SweepSouth, and many more e-commerce websites and apps across Africa to improve their conversion rates, mitigate risk, and optimize customer experience. Previously, Raul worked with a strategy consulting firm in Boston, USA, where he advised large retailers and airlines on e-commerce, marketing, and ancillary revenue streams. Catherine Corston is the general manager of one for You, the leading mass market consumer payments business in South Africa. Catherine began her career in the financial services sector before shifting to the fintech space in 2011, when she joined Flash. During her tenure at Flash, Catherine held various roles, including head of product and head of cellular strategy, and now her role as general manager at one for You. She is responsible for the strategic direction and growth of the one for You brand and business. Welcome, Raul and Catherine. Thanks, Adam. Hi, everyone. My name is Rahul. And as Adam mentioned, I'm one of the co-founders of Peach Payments. And we're very excited to be here today with Catherine and talk about you know, how um, cash and you know, bringing in the informal markets into digital commerce is the next step in building resilience in your businesses as we go along. Um, before we you know, dive deeper into that, I wanna quickly uh, provide some context. You know, so from at Peach, what we do is we work with any business that wants to sell a product through a digital channel and we provide them payment solutions that enable them to accept payments from their users and to pay out to their suppliers and vendors and part participants on these marketplaces. Um, we started with South Africa. We're now in Kenya, Mauritius, and adding more countries on the continent as we grow. Um, today, I like to say, if you're shopping online in South Africa, you're most likely paying with us. Um, you know, we, we've been fortunate and we've uh, worked with a lot of your favorite brands that you might be buying products and services from. And we've been working with them in optimizing their user experience journeys and you know, conversion rates throughout their checkout experience and especially on their payments leg. Um, over the past one and a half years, what, we, what all of us have experienced you know, through the whole COVID-19 pandemic is, has been a shock to the business environment, right? So, you know, before we talk about resilience, it's important to understand, you know, what is this shock and how does it impact your business today, right? So let's take a look at what did we see as the impact of COVID-19, you know, during the first um, six months of the pandemic. So what you see here is, you know, we looked at transaction data across various industry segments and we normalized it at, let's say, 100% in January. If you remember, I think it was around the middle of March when um, the president announced a lockdown and you immediately started to see some of the impacts of this pandemic in this period. Come April and May and June, this is really where you started to see the impact of this shock event on businesses. You know, industries like travel, retail, leisure and entertainment dipped to three to 10% of the volume they were doing in January. On the other hand, there were industries like you know online retail, data services and ISPs, um, you know, food and beverage, so grocery delivery that started to really take off. And what's important to understand is you know both ends of this spectrum is a shock to the business. And this has been this is nothing new. If you if we go back in time, you know, there's been multiple shock events throughout the past 20 years. It's, you know, with the dot-com bubble in 2000, we saw the, the mortgage crisis in 2009. You know, businesses in South Africa have been reeling under load shedding since 2014. We had the drought, which impacted tourism in a big way in 2016. And then now COVID. So as a business owner, you're constantly thinking about surviving if your business has been negatively impacted. But if your business is presented with an immense opportunity, then you also need to think about how to capture it and not have your entire operations collapse because now you're trying to meet this massive demand. So for, you know, from our perspective, resilience is this ability to bounce back 
from these failure or shock events and obstacles that are in your path. And at the same time, it's also being able to capture this windfall opportunity that these shock events create. So as a business owner, you're constantly thinking about, you know, how do you plan to use these shocks to your advantage? So planning for resilience means that you give your business every opportunity to grow and scale. Um, so the next question is, okay, how do you, how does digital commerce help you build resilience? You know, so if I, again, look back to early 2020, what we saw was a variety of different tactics that businesses were employing. You know, April to middle of May was a hard lockdown. So physical stores were closed. We saw a lot of our online retailers pull in sales, even though they could not deliver the product, but consumers were still buying on the premise that once deliveries are allowed, we'll get our product. People were, you know, restaurants were selling vouchers um, and taking deposits for uh, future meals, right? Wine farms rallied around restaurants and decided to offer wine as a, as a gift on each of these voucher sales as an incentive. So question is, you know, how do you think about your products and your services and how do you use digital commerce as a tool to help build resilience in your business? So what we decided to do today was to just give you, walk you through this journey and how you can think about it. You know, it all starts with your product. So what product or service are you selling? How would that work on a digital channel? You know, you might say, oh, but my product's not a standardized product that can be sold through a website. Actually, it doesn't matter. What It doesn't mean that you cannot sell digitally. It only changes what tools you will use to sell the, your product and service. Um, understanding your customer. Who is your customer? Where do they live? You know, how do they pay usually? What, how do they prefer to pay online? You know, are they businesses? Are you targeting individuals? Because that changes your go-to-market strategy. It changes how, what channels you employ, where do you advertise? So understanding your customer is absolutely critical. And once you're online, if you're not already collecting data, you should start collecting data because data will give you insights on, you know, how do you better connect with your customer? Which channels are performing better for you? Where should you market more? How do you improve operational efficiencies? What's the feedback you're getting from your customers to build better product? And each of these three elements basically starts to point towards a tech-centric business model. And here, I don't mean you start becoming a tech startup and you know, go all in on tech, but you, you almost start to employ technology to make your business better. You know, how do you automate operations? What are the digital experiences that bring your product closer to the customer? You know, where are they living online? How do you drive efficiencies across your supply chain? And from at Peach, you know, if, if you walk through these steps, it kind of gives you a very good idea of where to start. The way we've been thinking about it is also based on that customer journey, starting to think about what are these last miles? You know, so if you, I want, I want you to take a step back and think about, you know, when the lockdown and the COVID pandemic hit, were you ones who were saying, okay, how do I employ my digital channel? Or were you at that point in a mad scramble trying to go digital? So the toolkit or those four steps helps you prepare in advance of the shock events. And what we found was that digital really helped drive resilience in a lot of our customers. So the last miles, you know, there's the last mile of sourcing. Where are you buying your product from, right? There's the last mile of digital distribution. Are you going to go online with Shopify or Wix? Are you building a custom platform? Do you just need payment links? And then there's the last mile of payments, which talks about um, where we can go a bit deeper because that's really what we do. And the last mile of delivery, which is around, you know, how are you going to get your product to your customer? Now, each of these last miles plays a critical role. You know, it's not one or the other. You almost have to solve for all four to have a seamless experience for your customers. So today, you know, as we've been reflecting on the events of the past couple of years, 
you know, we decided to talk a bit more about what have we found is the last mile in online payments. As a business selling in a digital channel, your primary goal is to reduce the friction for your customer from being able to buy from you. You want to make it as easy as possible for them to transact with you. So the question is, you know, are you offering them enough choice in payment methods? You know, does your customer not have a card? Can they pay with EFT? You know, can, are they going to use a Zapper QR code or are they using buy now, pay later? Every customer matters and having a wider variety of payment methods makes it easier for the customer to overcome that hurdle of that purchase decision and buy from you. The second thing you're thinking about is conversion rate. You know, payments is all, all, often the last step in that conversion journey and one of the most critical ones. So at this point, you know, how does your payments partner or your solution help enable or drive conversion rate, right? So there's a number of different strategies we've helped employ from one-click checkouts to, you know, retries on failed payments. And the last step, Last thing that you're thinking about is how do you protect yourself and your customer from fraudulent activity? So these three aspects together create a delightful experience that then drives that last mile of payments. Now, one of the things, you know, we've been uh, working with Catherine and the One For You team is, is how do we bring cash and some of the informal markets more into the digital commerce ecosystem? Because we, at Peach, we truly believe that this is one of the biggest missing pieces of the puzzle, especially in the context of Africa. So I wanna take this opportunity to invite Catherine to tell us a bit more about you know, One For You and you know, our partnership with One For You. What is One For You? How, and you know, where do you fit in and how do you help drive this? Catherine, over to you. Thanks, Raul. Thanks for having me today. It's a great opportunity to discuss what we love and very passionate about that sort of last mile of payments. Um, so yeah, I'll just, I suppose, give you a bit of background to begin with on how we got to the product and, and how we feel it's so, it can definitely make such a big difference in, in, in the e-commerce environment specifically because largely a lot of consumers still remain selectively cash-based. Um, we understand that consumers have more than one bank account generally, but we, and so we often refer to this cash by choice. So there's definitely cash by necessity customers, and we understand that they, um, there is still an element of financial inclusion that has to happen, but significantly most customers are remaining cash, cash by choice customers. So on the back of the fact that Flash has for many, many years been involved in the sort of last mile economy um, in our 15 year sort of journey of rolling out or being involved in a network of 200,000 odd spaza shops, we've spent a lot of time understanding this market of um, customers that engage in that sort of last mile economy. And through this understanding and through this, this um, engagement with them and through this knowledge of the fact that they don't want to necessarily engage with a bank card and a bank account, and they generally do less than three transactions a month with their bank um, and then withdraw all their cash out, sat back and thought, how do we solve this customer's problem? They do want to be able to engage in the digital platforms and in the digital world. They do want to be able to have access to products and services that we all easily access using our bank cards, but they just don't want to do it with the bank card. So how can we go about engaging with these customers to offer them? Um, I mean, our, our absolute um, passion and purpose at Flash is certainly to make customers' lives easier. So how do we build a product that allows them to do this? It's an incredibly simple product. It's a pin-based product. So all we do is we take a customer's cash and we, re and we digitize it into what is very similar to an airtime pin. It's a 16-digit pin. Um, and it's something that our customer is very familiar and very comfortable with because they've engaged with it on, and through airtime for years and years and years. So um, the money goes out of the banking system it goes into, it gets redigitized into our, um, our one for you environments and ecosystem. And then it can then engage in a full massive, massive ecosystem of brands that are integrated into our platform um, and across a whole lot of industries. Um, it then means a customer can do anything they want to do in any kind of digital e-commerce platform. 
Um, when we launched it in 2019, we were unsure of, you know, we, we thought there was a problem that we were solving. Um, we wondered if it was going to have, do anything or not. Um, and we hope to, in the next sort of four to six months, hit half a billion rands worth of turnover a month. So it certainly proved that customers want to engage on the online environment um, yeah. as long as they can do it in a format that they're happy with and that they're comfortable with. So it seems to be proving that, that it is something that they are very, very happy with. Amazing, Catherine. So, Catherine, why should you know, why should merchants or partners care about this customer segment? Um, yeah. What have Arul, you guys I suppose, <laughs> I suppose um, every marketer in this country refers to it as the mass market. And it's not, I mean, they are, are right and wrong. And it's a passion point for us. And it's something that I feel very strongly about. And I always say the only reason it should be referred to as mass market is because of the absolute scale of the marketplace out there. Um, in every other way, it should never be lumped together as one customer base called mass market. Um, the nuances and the differences in the, and you know, that mass market should be broken down into so many different segments from that point forward. So we do, we spend a lot of time at one for you because our customers are so important to us doing a massive amount of one-on-one -on -one qualitative research to understand what customers really, really want. Um, they have problems just like we do in life um, and we make sure we try and solve problems for them. And I think if the e-commerce um, partners and um, your, you know, everyone that's listening kind of understand that what the customers out there need and want um, is they want some things that are very similar to what every other consumer wants. They want access, they want convenience, and they want quality and value. Mm -hmm. So the differences here is that it means something so significant to these consumers' lives. Um, so sometimes, you know, a five rand coin or a 10 rand note in our lives means very little. Um, in some of these consumers' lives, when they're shopping online, that can mean an entire day's worth of electricity. Mm. So it's, it's this mass amount of consumers that are available to every brand out there to tap into. But before you can do it, you've got to understand what their problems are and you've got to start to help solve them for them. Um, taxi fares are hugely problematic for customers. It's so simple and it's such simple things that can be solved for them. When they have to go and shop in a store, they catch a taxi there one way, which is prohibitively expensive. When they catch a taxi home, they then have to catch it. They have to book the seat next door to them or pay for the seat next door to them too to get the goods home. So that it becomes prohibitively expensive to shop. So once so so once you understand the problems that the customers have, um, but you also then understand the scale of the opportunity that exists, and you're able to then take the time to sit back. Um, and address those problems for the customers in ways that make real differences to them, um, the opportunity is enormous. Um, but it really does take a bit of nuances in what you do and what you address to the, for those customers. But they're absolutely crying out for the same level of rewards, loyalty, value, access, convenience. They're incredibly brand conscious, incredibly brand loyal, way so probably more than uh, certainly than I am probably um so yeah it's an exciting marketplace but it does take a lot of time and energy to understand what that marketplace wants and certainly can't be lumped into this let's go and understand the mass market um and I think if that's you know that way of thinking can start to be broken apart I think there's an incredible amount of value that can be unlocked yeah, it's a, it's an it's an eye opening perspective, right? Like that, um, for for some segments, while convenience is the biggest driving factor, you know, in some markets like in the mass market, digital commerce or can make a meaningful difference because at the end of the day, it's beyond convenience. It's it's like you said, it's saving them, it's giving them another day of electricity. So every brand should be scrambling to try and get you know product and services. Um, into the broader market as well. But I guess, you know, there's multiple problems to solve. Um, logistics will be another one. But from a payments perspective, you know, how can we access the segment? Because not all of them have, a, you know, have a card or are willing to expose their bank accounts to digital commerce. So, so where does, you know, how do we access this market? 
So, Raul, I, th- I mean, I think that's very relative. I mean, you'll see some quotes that are sitting on the screen now, and these are from real interviews you've done with real consumers out there. Um, there is an absolute fear of, of linking a bank card onto um, online. Um, I think it has to be acknowledged and respected. So I think, first of all, for e-commerce um, businesses or businesses that are you know, in this process, first of all, just understand and respect that is the, my first bit of advice. Um, there are great products coming out in the marketplace. Ours happens to be one of them. There, we do have great competitors out there too. Um, so embrace the newer products. So understand that customers might not want to link a bank card and look for alternatives. And my second piece of advice too is that very often, and it's understandable for um, you know for an online shopping environment for a brand, the the part of the shopping experience that's so important there is that they can you know, exposing the product range and ensuring that the brand, the branded products are so beautifully exposed and you get to the payment page and it's somewhat sort of a, okay, well now just execute your payments and off you go. It sort of becomes the last little bit of the, you know, the process and it's given very little attention and focus. For the consumer, mm-hmm. it's the part that's the most triggering almost and the most sensitive. Um, and you'll find, I mean, we've looked at so many examples of where that at that point on in the in the flow of the customer's experience, it's probably given the least thought in the platform or in that journey for the customer. Um, and it's at that point that you probably find a hell of a lot of drop off happens because it's confusing and it's given a very little thought from the customer's perspective. So the choice of the sneaker, the, the categorization of the goods. Um, you know, the frequently viewed, or you might also want to purchase this, that's beautifully done and understandably so. Um, and you get to the payment part of the process, not so much thoughts put into it. And it's the most, the part where the customer is going to be the most sensitive. So my, I'd appeal that, the, ensure that the parts where you know your customer is going to be the most sensitive about it, invest a lot of time and effort into understanding what your customer is going to, you know, the sensitivity around that part of it. So find out how your customers want to pay embrace new technology embrace if you look at some of the other products that are coming to market now like all your bnpl stuff understand how your customers get paid and the frequency of repayments so that you align things like that um, and then understand how to um, enhance that part of your checkout process to make sure your customers start to get peace of mind and invest in education on that part of it too um, I think that will make such an enormous difference to this customer uh, segment and their experience on e-commerce. So Catherine, one last one uh, quick blurb on like, how does one for you work? So what, how does one for you bridge that cash economy into digital? Like, can you just walk us through the, a quick overview of the product journey? Like, so what does a consumer do with one for you? And sure. you know, how do we, how are you working together? Super, super simple products. So essentially what we are doing with Peach is we are, into, obviously we're integrating, your, we, we've done an integration into your platform. From a customer journey perspective, it's ubiquitously available and that's what's so critical. So a customer could be sitting at home um, in the most rural area, to be honest. They can do the e-commerce transaction on their phone. They could get to the point of the payment part. Our one for you voucher is available at every one of our 200,000 spaza shops across the country. So generally, a spaza shop is a couple of meters from everybody's home, as well as across all mul- a multiple amounts of national retailers and in, in some of the banking uh, plat- digital platforms as well. So once they know how much they want to spend, they can go and purchase a one for you voucher. Um, and then if the, you know, so if someone is using Peach would then be able to add one as a payment option, the customer then simply inputs a 16 digit pin that they purchased. It's literally a mm-hmm. slip of paper. They input the 16 digit pin. Um, if it's obviously a rounded number. So if the, the sale doesn't equal the amount of the voucher, we return a change voucher to that customer by uh, using an SMS functionality, they get the change sent to them on their phone number and the sales concluded. Um, so the trick about this product is absolutely its simplicity. Um, they, there are no transaction fees to a customer ever. It's completely free. And cash is king and you're taking away that fear of linking yeah. their bank cards online. Absolutely. So, and yeah, and, and you know, that's really one of the reasons why we working with you guys and partnering and bridging this uh, big gap in digital commerce um, and bringing cash into the fold. So we're excited to 
uh, work with you and for everyone listening you know we we've got a land, um, wait list on www.peachpayments forward slash one for you as one number one f o r y o u so let us know if you're keen we will be launching um in a full launch towards the end of the year or early next year um and we're going to do some testing and piloting for now but I, i'm really looking forward to this catherine I, i feel this will be a game changer in digital commerce in africa as are we thanks Thank you so much, much for having me Thank you Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Raul. Thank you, Catherine.